This week we're continuing with what we started last week. Matthew chapter 22, 34 through 40. Last week we cut, trying to talk a little faster, because last week it was notified, I was notified, that the song service, the announcements, the prayer time was shorter, and that's the reason why we got out, because I still preached for 40 minutes. I'm sorry. So I'm trying to talk faster so we can still get out of here at a decent time. All right, so here we go. That's as fast as I can go, folks. <laughs> I've already run out. <laughs> Continuing on from last week, where we talked, where, where we just took the first commandment, and we covered what it means to love God. This week, we'll talk about what it means to love our neighbor. I was asked, who is my neighbor this morning? Maybe Tim will cover that next week. I often catch myself, sometimes I don't catch myself, and I outwardly say it, I'm a human, first to admit, but if somebody does something wrong to me, cuts me off, impatient, whatever, sometimes I think and unfortunately voice, hopefully my daughter doesn't hear it too often, Something to the effect of, I hate people. And, and I don't really mean it. It's just the, the action that has just encountered that frustrates me. And then I let my human voice take over. And, and I, I sometimes say it. I, I definitely think it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because I don't hate people. I love people. I have a job where I get to help people. And sometimes it's draining, and sometimes there's just the mundane, regular calls. But on occasion, just last week, we had an 18-year-old girl who was in a fairly significant heart uh, dysrhythmia, uh, and... All of the team recognized it. We started the actions. She was able to convert herself. She, her heart was beating 180 times a minute. Obviously, that's not normal. Um, just sitting there in class, no big deal, starts beating. They had already identified that she may have a problem, but they hadn't got all, of, like she's not on medications yet or anything like that. So we notified that, I mean, we, we acknowledge that there is a problem. We knew what the problem was. We knew how to take care of the problem. Thankfully, her heart decided to start beating normally before we had to take all of these actions, but we still needed to take her to the hospital. So if she's in the back of the ambulance, and she's an 18-year-old girl that's just high on life, and she was like, hey, you got any tunes back here? And I was like, no. And she was like, you care if I turn some on? I said, no. She was like, what do you like? And I was like, oh, mostly country, but you probably, all of a sudden, now I've got Luke Combs playing. I'm like, okay. And... She was like, hey, you, you care if I do some other stuff? And I was like, what do you mean? And then she pulls out her phone and she starts taking selfies. She was like, let's make this an experience. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and it was really cool because she went from something that was very significant to now everything's just perfectly fine. And I love people. I love, I didn't do anything. But we had an experience back there. And it was fun. I love people. I might say things otherwise, but I love people. It's just the actions. We're in a me first society now. It's whatever I can do for me, and then I'll think about you. That's not the way it used to be. That's not the way you were taught. You were taught by your parents that it is look after others, right? To be courteous, to be kind, to help your neighbor, to offer a hand to the elderly, whether it's helping them with their shopping bags or opening the door. Open the door for everyone, 
that's the kind of things that we were taught. But that's not the society that we live in currently. And so it's unfortunate that I think these things and unfortunately say some of these things. Matthew chapter 22. We'll just read it again. This is last week's text, but it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Renee already stole the thunder. She already said that all of those laws, 600, 700, whatever you said, all of those laws, down to 10, and then 10 down to 2. If you'll flip over to Leviticus real quick, Leviticus chapter 19, Starting in verse 9, it says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Continuing, you shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am your Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. If you have those topics, those headings, you'll see right before verse 9, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a long list of things that God identified to Moses when he was writing this. And then, Jesus says, just to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor like you love yourself, if you take care of the people that are around you, then you don't have to worry about all of these other laws and things because you're going to love them. You're going to care for them. You don't have to worry about, I mean, we don't have a whole lot of farmers and vineyard keepers and all that stuff, but that's the way they took care of the poor and the, and the widows. Love your neighbor as yourself. In John chapter 13, Jesus says it a different way. John chapter 13, verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. My grandpa, my grandpa Jordan, he was a small town, small church pastor and also worked construction. That guy knew everybody. I kid you not, we would go anywhere 
And when I say anywhere, I mean when we got to Florida and was standing in line to Disney, he would be talking to people because he knew them. I have no clue how. Anytime we would go to St. Louis, that was usually our vacation-ish type stuff. It was Six Flags, ballpark, stuff like that. He would be talking to people because he knew them. If he didn't know them, he would still be talking to them. He dealt well with others. He never dealt unfairly with anyone during a construction project. And he didn't deal unfairly with people when they were coming to his churches. He was held in high regard. And they knew that he was a disciple because of the way he treated them. Because he's, I don't remember him just loving everybody, but he was just a friendly, welcoming guy who, conversely, knew everybody, and everybody seemed to be friends with him. Are you held in high regard? Our next passage, Mark chapter 2. Now we're going to start getting into the meat here a little bit. Mark chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining. Again, sorry, this give you the, the forefront. This is as he's getting ready to call Levi. Uh, had just called Levi, say, follow me. And then Levi invites him into his home. And so in verse 15, as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, does he eat with these people? Why does he eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, those are the ones that need the doctor. I came to call the righteous. I came not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. Let me redo that again because I messed it up. I came not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. Who are the unlovelies in your life? I already started. I already told you the things that kind of bother me. It's actually a very long list, unfortunately. Two that grind my gears probably the most, though. When I'm sitting at the light and the person is on the on in the left turn lane, it goes red. And again, I, I know that if that person is, the first person is up a little bit, yeah, now they're going to be blocking traffic. So, okay, go ahead. Get out of the way. But when number two, three, four, and five, and however many behind them decide to make that left turn, too, on the red, The other day we went to the store. Kristen and Hannah were just running in to grab something. I don't particularly care to go into the store, so if it's just going to be a quick trip, I'll sit out in the truck. This person was parked kind of halfway up on the curb, fire lane. Bumper is right up next to the to the crosswalk. And they come out, again, it's one of those things where... Yeah, if you needed to run in and grab one thing and it was going to take you a half a minute, maybe. This, this guy comes out with a cart full of stuff. He'd been in there a while. Surely you've got some unlovelies that you can think of, right? Or is it just me? Oh, good. Good, it's not just me. Who are the ten sinners and the tax collectors in your life? Who are the people that we need to love? It 
It's easy to love people that we like. It's easy to love people that we get along with. It's easy to love people that have the same common interest in us. You're sitting out at the campground. Well, I love everybody out there. I had guys coming up. I had some some fella come over across the street, and we sat and talked for 15, 20 minutes last night. Then I went over to another fire, and I visited with those people. It's easy to love people when you have the same interests, when you have common interests, but what about the ones that, that you don't agree with, that have a different political affiliation than you? What about those? Jesus shows us time and time again how to love. As he demonstrates this love in the Bible, I've identified two attributes that come out over and over. The first one is being impartial. He invites everyone. He has no partiality towards anyone. And the other one is being intentional. He ate with the sinners and the tax collectors and all the other unlovely people. As you read through the Gospels, you can see how Jesus is intentional with others. A few years back when we, Kristen and I worked with John and Anna Devine in the college age ministry, he was going through a series, I believe it was on love, And then when he got to the end of that series, he wanted everyone to pick a word that was going to identify what they were dealing with at the time or something that they wanted to be better at as they were going forward. Just pick a word. As each person went around the circle and chose their words, Anna wrote them down. John gave him a Bible verse for it, and then Anna turned around and made it into a bookmark. Our one word aims for this year. Will was love, 1 John 4, 7. Joey, boldness, Joshua 2, 11. Cynthia, trust, Psalm 91, 1. Jen Kozich, content, Uh, that one didn't get a verse. Sarah uh, was courageous, Deuteronomy 31, 6. Josh was weight, Nathan was favor, Mariel was faith, Kristen was healthy, Anna was steadfast, Eric was to commit, and John was to kneel. And then on the back of that bookmark, it says, God's questions to us deserve as much time as our questions to him. There are handful of questions to think about, but the one is, who do people say that I am, and who do you say that I am? Jesus is love. He ate with those people. When Kristen and I, I should rephrase that, when I volunteered Kristen to team with me to start in on middle school ministry, when John left, the first thing she said was, we should come up with that word, and, it wasn't we should, she already had it, we should come up with a word for our ministry for this year, and that word is, intentional. We need to intentionally invite our young people to come to church. We need to intentionally welcome them. We need to intentionally pray for them and teach them to pray for others. We need to intentionally instruct them in the Bible as well as everyday life to help form and shape them in this impressionable time. We need to intentionally plan time to attend their functions. We need to do these things for them. They need to do so they can see that they are loved. 
We need to intentionally show them the love of Christ so that they will be able to receive that love and pass it on to their friends. And that leads me into our first point. The first point is the sinner that comes out of John chapter 4. But the best part is at the end of the story. So let's look at our first unlovely. John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is talking about the woman at the well. I've got highlighted 1 through 45 rather than read. Let's see if we can sum up, uh, come up with a good summary hitting some of the high spots here, mostly the red letters. Jesus was traveling. They were going through Samaria. He stopped at the sixth hour, so middle of the day, and he stopped next to the well. There wasn't anybody next to that well. He just sat there, and he waited. And then the woman come up, and he says to her, give me a drink. We'll put in the please part. Give me a drink. She says, wait a second. First off, I'm a woman. People don't talk to women. I'm a Samaritan. Jews don't talk to Samaritans. Why are you asking me for a drink? And he says, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd be asking me for a drink. Because I have the living water. And she says, I don't enjoy coming to the well in the middle of the day with this big old heavy jar. So if you have something that you can give me, I'll take it. And then he goes on to explain what that living water is. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I have to give will never be thirsty again. The water that I am I will give will spring up water, a well of eternal life. And she says, "Give me some of that." And he says, "Okay, I'll give it to you, but Go and call your husband. She says, well, that's a problem. I don't have one. And he says, right, you are. For you've already had five, and the person that you're with now is not your husband. And she says, you must be a prophet or something. You know a lot of stuff. And then he goes on, and he says, that I am not a prophet, that I am... The one. And she says, well, we know that we're supposed to be waiting for the Messiah. And he says, well, you're talking to him. And the really cool part of this story is just as soon as they get done talking, she runs back to town. And what does she do? She says, come and see this man who told me everything about me and never met me. In verse 39, it says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of her testimony. Before they even heard the words come out of his mouth already. They heard what she had to say about him, and they believed. And then... When they got to him and they listened and they asked him to stay two days with them, there were many more added. After that he departed, but how many did he commit from the Samaritans? There was a great hatred between the Samaritans and the Judeans back Uh, going back to 722 B.C. That was when the northern ten tribes had been taken captive by Assyria and taken to Medea. Other captured people were resettled in northern Palestine, and through the years these pagans intermarried with what was left of the Israelite population. 
The Jewish people considered Samaritans to be religious half-breeds and heretics. You saw how impartial he was to her, right? That she was a woman. That she was a Samaritan. All he needed was a drink. But he chose that time to be able to minister to her. When he told her about her sins, he could have punished her. He could have chastised her. He could have made her feel something awful. But he didn't do it. He was very frank, got right to the point, and said, that's not why I'm here. Let's talk about me. He invited her in when nobody else would. When all of those other gals that she would go to the well with finally pushed her away because they didn't want to be part, part with her, he said, you can be a part of me. He was intentional because he took that time of day knowing full well that there shouldn't be anybody at the well, not in the middle of the day, not in the heat of the day. But he knew that she would be. And then he was intentional by telling her that he was the Messiah and what the Messiah meant. Because of his impartial and intentional love, many believed in him just because of the words she had to say, and many more were added because of the words he had to say. Our second one, another unlovely, this one is the tax collector, Luke chapter 19. My guess is this guy didn't have a lot of friends either. Who loves the tax collector? Raise your hand. Not many. I don't personally know any tax collectors, so I can't not love them. But the guy who ever picks up my check at the P.O. box in Cincinnati that I just sent it off to, he's definitely not my favorite person. But Jesus was impartial again, wasn't he? When you look at Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 10, you see Zacchaeus. And you probably remember this song. And the song is fairly inclusive of most of the details of this passage. Talks about how rich he was. No friend. Jesus was impartial because he picked this guy and he walked over to the tree and there's your intentionality too. He walked over to the tree and he told the little fellow to come down because he needed to go to his house. Look what happens when the man experiences the love of Christ. Is it up there? Can you? Oh, never mind. That was the one I told you not to put up there. Sorry. Luke? Huh? Oh, good. Give me 8 and 10. Perfect. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore them fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of, son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. There's two from Jesus' ministry. There's many others. If you go through the Gospels, you can see it time and time again. But as you read through the Gospels, you see Jesus doing the work. And yes, He is the one that gave us the order to love our neighbor as ourself. And he is the one that shares and shows. But, I mean, you can look at him and you're like, I mean, you're, you're mostly God, so it's easy for you. Right? Well, my last point has to deal with a couple of other guys. Human dudes. The story starts in Acts chapter 6, 
when the disciples at that time, the apostles at that time, were inundated with all of the work that they had to do. There were many that were coming. And so the apostles said, all right, pick some guys that can help us. They need to be able to do the other stuff. Stephen was picked as one of those guys. In chapter 7, it talks about that he was full of grace and power. I'm going to have to have glasses soon. I'm going to have to, he's full of grace and power and doing many signs and wonders. Continues in chapter 7, he has an eloquent speech when he's called in trial because the high priest in the council was accusing him of blasphemy and making up stories and lies. So he goes through this whole big speech, and when he ends his speech, they grab him and they stone him. They put him to death. And if you'll turn over to Acts chapter 7, verse 54, we'll catch up with the part of the story that needs the attention. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Continuing in verse 1 of chapter 8, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, and Samaria, except the apostles, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Verse 3, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Acts chapter 26. We see a little more of Saul's actions. As he's uh, giving testimony as a believer. Acts chapter 26, verse 9, says this. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even into foreign cities. One last quick one. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. I'll just read it for you before, instead of you turning over there. It says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. When you look at Acts chapter 9, You see the conversion of Saul. You see him walking on the road on the way to Damascus and he's preparing to persecute more Christians. And Jesus comes to him in a light and says, Saul, Saul, why do you, why do you persecute me? Then he sends him on down the road. Blind, because that was part of the 
experience with Jesus. Now he was blind. Now, now he had these things covering his eyes. And he gets instruction. Somebody will be there to pray with me. And then we get to see the side of Ananias. These are two, two men that are called by God. An unlikely pair. verse uh, 10, it says, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at that house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Ananias said, could have said, Wrong number. Sorry, I'm not interested. Right? Because we know what Saul has been doing. He's been getting rid of Christians left and right. Sorry, I'm not available. Wait a second, Lord. Are you sure about this? Have you heard? I know you're God, but have you heard the things that he's been doing? Do you really want me to go over there? If you look over at verse 15, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but at verse 15 it says, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. I have picked him out of the crowd. And he's got a job to do. It goes on to say, For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I've picked him, but he's going to see. Don't you worry, Ananias. He'll see. The Lord intentionally chose Saul because he was now the chosen instrument. He was obviously impartial because look at all of the things that Saul had done in his career leading up to his conversion. I don't know what her father-in-law had done in the past. I don't know what her friend's friend or, or whomever just came to Christ recently. I don't know what had happened to them in the past 50-some years. But it didn't matter to Jesus. It doesn't matter one bit. How many were added to the church through the impartial and intentional love that Saul, later known as Paul, was shown that day? He wrote, the most, he wrote most of the New Testament. He carried it all over the countryside. Gentiles wouldn't have heard had it not been for Paul because that was what Jesus had elected. An article from Christianity.com asked, what is the significance of the woman at the well? The answer was this. It shows Jesus' love for the world, the fact that the woman at the well was in such low standing because of her gender, because of her race, and because of her marital status. Yet they talked directly almost as equal conversational partners. This shows Jesus' love and his heart for all people. The unlovely, not just the lovely. Can we love better? Can you love, love those that might be unlovely to you? The sinners and the tax collectors in, in your life and in your mind? I'll close with this. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself.
Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for your patience. Because when we leave it up to ourselves, we might not go out and reach the unlovely. But Father, that's who you called us to love. It's easy to love those that we like, that we're related to sometimes. But you've called us past that. We ask for your spirit to fill us. Because if we lean on ourselves, we'll just miss the mark. Please, Lord, fill us. In your son's name we pray.